Hey everyone, welcome to a Harvard News Recap for the week. This week was slammed with news because AMD had its announcements for Computex 2022, including X570. We covered those, but there's more detail now. NVIDIA had sort of an announcement at the show. Uh, and multiple case companies, cooler companies, everybody's been putting out product announcements this past week. So we're going to be covering that in at least this news video, but we might have to run two just because of the density of news. So let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by EVGA's X570 Dark motherboard. The EVGA X570 Dark is a high-end motherboard for AM4 CPUs, built around extreme overclocking and tested heavily by EVGA's Kingpin. The X570 Dark has a uniquely rotated socket and RAM layout, 90 degree rotated cables for ease of installation and management, and tons of troubleshooting features to make building, testing, and overclocking easier. Check out EVGA's X570 Dark high-end motherboard at the link in the description below. First up, this is super interesting. So AMD's X670 motherboards will have more or less two chipsets per board, or at least it'll have two packages of substrate and silicon to form a singular chipset known as X670. This will be all X670 and X670E motherboards, where X670E, as a reminder, if you missed our AMD news recap video, is basically a batch saying it's still the same chipset as X670. It's not technically a different piece of hardware. It just guarantees different PCIe lane assignments. Anyway, we have the AM5 news coverage, the B650 X670 coverage, and the Zen 4 CPU coverage in that other AMD news video. We'll link that in the description below. But for this one, it started with a new leak from serial leaker 9550 Pro on Twitter, which suggested that the Asus Prime X670P Wi-Fi motherboard might contain what looks like two chipsets. It almost resembled the older Northbridge Southbridge approach. And MSI later revealed publicly, and we've also since confirmed with motherboard manufacturers officially, that X670 and X670E motherboards, all of them, will have this dual chipset look to the configuration. Now, to be clear, each piece of the chipsets shown in the original Asus leak and the MSI board shots later, that's all part of one X670 combined chipset. But splitting them into two pieces of silicon allows for more I.O., the theoretically shorter trace length between each one, depending on how they map the traces, and lower power density in a single spot to achieve the same I.O. with less of a thermal constraint. We've also confirmed that X670 boards will not need a chipset fan this time around, so that should make a lot of people very happy to get the whiny fans out of the case. The Zen 4 CPUs, just so you know, have 24 assignable PCIe lanes, and then there are four additional PCIe lanes that go to the chipset, uh, and these are not negotiable. This is also fairly standard. So Asus's board leak depicts one standard location chipset south of the RAM and then another part of the chipset just below the primary PEG slot. Board manufacturers also told us that B650, which is coming out after the X670 launch, will be more standard in that it'll just have one chipset cohesively in one spot on the motherboard. That is in line with controlling cost on the cheaper B series motherboards and also that it won't need as much I.O. So we'd imagine that a lot of this is for improving the uh, amount of I.O. that's available while maintaining the thermal envelope so that you don't need a fan. And potentially, depending on how much this really matters at the end of the day, but potentially getting each piece of the chipset a little bit closer to the I.O. It's ultimately communicating with how much that matters. There's probably a little bit less than on the just expanding I.O. capability side of things. Next one, AMD corrected itself on the power capabilities and limitations of the AM5 socket. So AMD originally stated in its announcements that the socket would support up to 170 watt TDP CPUs. We noted in our coverage that this number is a little bit nebulous since AMD's TDP calculation is based on things like the thermal resistance of the heat sink you use and the temperature of uh, the T case and T ambient. And so all those numbers were screwy anyway. But 170 watt TDP was the number they gave us. This ended up getting corrected. AMD later said AMD would like to issue a correction to the socket power and TDP limits of the upcoming AMD socket AM5. AMD socket AM5 supports up to a 170 watt TDP with a PPT limit up to 230 watts. TDP times 1.35 is the standard calculation for TDP versus PPT for AMD sockets in the Zen era, and the new 170 watt TDP group is no exception. AMD further said, quote, this new TDP group will enable considerably more compute performance for high core count CPUs and heavy compute workloads, which will sit alongside the 65 watt and 105 watt TDP groups that Ryzen is known for today. AMD takes great pride in providing the enthusiast community with transparent and forthright product capabilities 
and we want to take this opportunity to apologize for our error and any subsequent confusion we may have caused on this topic. Simple enough for that one then. Next one is about MSI. MSI has some new X670 motherboards for AM5 that were just revealed in the last few days. So this is in line with the X670 announcements. All the board manufacturers have stuff to show this week. And uh, we'll, we'll get to MSI's new pop your style for honor and not the video game. And the other weird bullshit they're saying in a moment. There's, there's some new branding initiatives, but we're going to start with the products. The company showed off its MSI MPG, which means MSI Performance Gaming, so it's MSI MSI PG, X670E Carbon Wi-Fi, which is a high-end board with two PCIe Gen 5x16 slots, two PCIe Gen 5x4 M.2 slots, and two PCIe Gen 5x4 non-M.2 slots. That is a lot of PCIe lanes getting split a lot of different ways. So the IO on AM5 is looking intense, at least for X670 plus the CPU. Uh, there's, there's a lot of capability here and expansibility with M.2 devices, GPUs and capture cards, things like that. Anyway, MSI says that the Carbon will be an 18 plus two VRM design using 90 amp power stages. Not the craziest we've seen, but still on the very high end. And looking at the photo and the NVIDIA reveal MSI did, it looks like most of the embellishments for this one are focused on just the LED on the left side. We think the Pro series of X670P Wi-Fi boards, not X670E, has a better look, at least with the more functional large finned heatsink for the VRM on both flanks of the socket. This board is relatively bare overall in terms of over-the-top lighting embellishments and uh, on-board function troubleshooting type buttons, but it makes it one of the more generally function-focused options for X670 thus far. MSI also revealed its godlike motherboard, which is a larger board that it classifies as EATX, although no actual dimensions were given, and it claimed it hosts a 24 plus two stage VRM using 105 amp MOSFETs. This is clearly an overclocking motherboard. There's a lot of capability in that. It is geared towards LN2 liquid nitrogen overclocking, uh, and we wouldn't be shocked if it lands closer to $1,000 than $500. Uh, as a bonus, MSI is also including and has revived its cringeworthily named Expanders add-on card for extra PCIe slots. I refuse to say Expander Z. It's spelled Expanders, and that's what we're going to go with. And that hosts two Gen 5 by 4 M.2 slots. You socket that into a PCIe slot on the board. Finally, other than some middle options like the MSI Ace, MSI also showed off its new Workstation WRX80 motherboard for Threader for 5000 Pro Workstation CPUs. This is huge. It's also an EATX classification on the large side of it. And that's got VRM situated on the left and the right of the socket rather than the top and the side. And it also has the memory flanking the socket vertically instead of horizontally. All the power is positioned in the top right corner of the board with a large chipset heatsink and cooler attached to the M.2 heatsinks as well. For PCIe slots, the board has seven and that sort of revives the glory days of the old EVGA dual socket board we have lying around here somewhere. So currently the trend for what we're seeing in the last week is a lot of IO on motherboards. NVIDIA demos a 500 Hertz display. We're getting there. We're getting to, to true peak eSports. The display is pretty crazy, genuinely, in terms of the frequency. Uh, the keynote, unfortunately, was completely devoid of any other interesting information, at least in the enthusiast and DIY. It had a few interesting server things, but most of it was just talking about how many millions of creators there are and millions of gamers there are, and we're adding them to our ranks and other sort of weird drum-beating, investor-focused marketing language uh, and drivel. But the 500 hertz display was worth talking about. So this one is a 1080p 24-inch TN panel. It's actually made by Asus. This is going to be an Asus ROG Swift monitor, and it's targeted squarely at the eSports crowd, where NVIDIA spent some time going through human benchmarking trials showing increases in efficacy in-game at different refresh rates. It's actually kind of cool information, and they've done good data collection with this in the past. The panel will have G-Sync eSports mode with vibrance adjustments and will also include reflex analyzer, which is a technology that we actually did think was pretty cool when we first ran benchmarks on it on actually an Alienware panel. Up next, getting into some cases, Streetcom has a new DA6 and DA6XL series of cases, if you can call them cases. They're more like frames, really. 
And Streetcom, if you don't know, is the same company that manufactures the open bench table. We use several of them in our office here. Uh, pretty functional and, and good benchmarking uh, tables, if that's all you do. But their new one is a vertical orientation case. And these frames are completely open and uh, suboptimal for cat owners. But otherwise, they might make for accessible PC builds for easy maintenance and component swapping with a relatively small form factor. Streetcom says the DA6 is about 16 liters for internal volume with the XL at 17.6 liters. It is also self-aware enough and quick to point out that the cases are, quote, admittedly on the upper limit of SFF or small form factor, but it counters with a focus on materials quality and ease of installation. The structure is made with 19 millimeter stainless steel tubes and a unibody wrap. Streetcom chose this over aluminum for structure as it allows the rods to better support components with universal brackets that Streetcom is also providing. These brackets can slide on the rails that make the frame and adjust for different component types and sizes. Some of the components, like the motherboard tray, are made of more standard 6063 aluminum. For marketing, Streetcom mostly promotes its fully open airflow and shows various rendered configurations with radiators, fans, and large tower coolers. The DA6 fits mini ITX boards and video cards around the size of an FE card, and the DA6 XL fits basically any video card. These use those previously mentioned universal brackets for things like support uh, and also for installation of fans, radiators, and uh, anything you might mount to the case within the frame. Price and the release date, though, are yet to be determined, and we'll, uh, we, we may get these in to look at because they're kind of interesting. Up next, Antec is in the news. Antec, a lot of you probably remember from early in the days of PC DIY enthusiast type branching out when the computers started getting a lot more interesting. Uh, they're still around. It's been a while since they've had a big hit but the new Canon case is trying to be one of them. It's a scaled up version of an existing Antec case called the Striker, and its price is going to be $500. Very expensive. This is uh, certainly on the high end for trying to get back in the news for Antec. This is designed with open loop cooling in mind. It's similar in some ways to the Cougar Conquer, or the Thermal Take Core P series of cases. The design of the Canon is relatively straightforward. The main body of the case consists of two metal panels that the various system components will be attached to. Most of the cable routing will be done between these two panels, but there are also two smaller solid panels at the base of the case to help conceal cables and drives. There are three tempered glass panels, but the gaps between all of those panels mean the Canon is essentially open. Motherboard support is listed as what they call EATX, and they say up to 305 millimeters to 272 millimeters, which meets the SSI CEB standard, but not quite the SSI EEB larger standard. Motherboards in the Canon are rotated 90 degrees though, so theoretically a larger board could fit. It would just stick out of the top of the system. The main location for a GPU in the Canon is at the front of the case, facing out. If the tempered glass side panel is left on, a GPU won't fit directly in the motherboard because of how close the glass panel is to the board. So the alternative location for the GPU is parallel to the board where the rotated layout puts the GPU at the bottom edge of the motherboard. The focus on the Canon is on its support for water cooling. Nearly every surface of the case can support a radiator, and renders of the built systems highlight the ability to support up to two separate loops for GPU and CPU with some space to spare. This includes support for 420mm radiators at the rear of the case. Technically, the Antec Canon is available now. It's one of the few things in the past week that actually can be purchased. Uh, not where we live, though. Antec only links two sites. One of them is a UK retailer we can't access. And the other one is CoolMod, which is a Spanish retailer. CoolMod lists the Canon at 480 euros or 510 USD. While some companies announced boring physical objects that you can obtain for currency this week, like CPUs, motherboards, and video cards, MSI decided to take a different approach and instead announced updates to its branding for a marketing cluster that it created previously and now needs to clean up. MSI definitely planned very well and uh, intentionally when it decided to start all of its initials for its motherboard families with M and end them all with G, leaving only the central P, E, or A to change. And as such, anyone who's confused by these just doesn't get it. But instead of fixing the problem, MSI decided to double down on the meaningless acronyms by adding word vomit subtitles and weird background text. For example, there's the MEG series, which MSI says is the flagship line and is subtitled The Revelation of Legend. Thanks, MSI. That really helps clarify what... Which one was it? MEG means. See? 
The description contains some nonsense about mysterious runes and ancient civilizations because nothing says high performance computers like RuneScape and ancient civilizations. MSI calls the triangular logo, quote, iconic, which is probably why Game Diaz and Montek also happened to choose this very similar logo long before MSI got to it. Next, MSI refreshed its MPG line, whose font confusingly looks like it says MAG, which is a different line entirely that MSI sells. The tagline for MPG is, be ahead, pop your style. We have experience with components that pop and we wouldn't recommend them. According to MSI, MPG products are supposed to be, uh, quote, trendy and, quote, with street style. Now, probably, and we don't want to take too much credit here, this is because of our in-house hype beast use of MSI swag products previously. Finally, there's the MAG line, which is not MPG, even though it looks like it, just because the font for MPG is bad. MSI says MAG contains, quote, military elements, and it plans to, to quote, recruit more players. That's a little creepy. The tagline is, uh, quote, unite as one, but the background text of for honor is stranger, given that the game currently has only mixed reviews on Steam. MSI Mag Football Manager probably would have been a more successful subtitle here. Hopefully the inclusion of For Honor, Unite as One, Pop Your Style, <laughs> and Revelation of Legend will add some clarity, finally, to what MSI MPG, MEG, and MAG mean. And just as a reminder, MSI created these initialisms. It's not like they, they discovered them and then had to explain the ancient runes. They created them, they made no sense, so then they created ancient runes to describe them. Also, the M in each one stands for MSI. It's kind of at the same level as Cooler Master Master Cooler. It's a thing that exists. Look it up. Up next, a motherboard announcement, this one about Asus. So AMD had already announced Asus's Crosshair X670 Extreme Extreme. That is the name. Uh, but Asus has since published further details on the motherboard. First off, Asus says that it is launching AM5 to the fifth power motherboards, and then it repeats the AM5 to the fifth language a few times. Some reason that's clever, we're still not sure why, but our future roundups are going to run a little bit long if Asus is being serious here, because that's 3,125 motherboard SKUs that they'll apparently be launching. The crosshair was detailed as running 20 plus two power stages that are 110 amp spec, this is the highest we've seen on consumer enthusiast boards anytime recently. Additionally, Asus revealed four other motherboards for X670. One is the tough gaming motherboard, or renders of it at least, taking mostly a matte blackout theme with white accents. Another was the Asus Prime, a largely silver and black themed design with heat sinks on top, bottom, and left center for the VRM components, and an RGB LED block or Maybe a display we can't tell yet over the I.O. The Asus Pro Art board was also shown using a simpler finned heatsink around the socket and cut down features generally. And finally, the Asus ROG Strix board was shown for some RGB gaming flair. So that's it for this hardware news recap. We have a ton of additional news and other videos coming up. Some really fun case reviews. The H7 Flow is already up, but we have a more unique case we're looking at shortly. And then there's, there's just a lot of really cool scientific pieces we have in the works where we took a short break over the last two weeks or so. We really skipped a lot of publishing days and that allowed us to push some content through we've been working on for a long time and finally finish some stuff. So you're gonna be seeing some of the first official, really technical test data out of our lab in the building. And uh, that'll include some, uh, just to give you a preview, some frequency spectrum analysis of, for example, the Steam Deck and its fans, one of the controversies recently. Anyway, really excited about all that. So get subscribed if you're not. And you can go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. Thank you for watching. We'll see you all next time.